Hello everyone. I'm very delighted to be here and thrilled to present this presentation to you. Anti-fragile enterprises do not follow predictive rules and predictive patterns. In fact, by the very definition of anti-fragile enterprise, it means those enterprises enjoy change and get a lot of energy in handling change. One of the foundation elements that really let organizations gain anti-fragility coefficient is by the constant acquisition of new skills and having a very effective ongoing learning mechanism. Now, the rate at which the digital tech stack is evolving in companies, and a, a, a Python engineer, for example, would have to work really hard to keep up to date so that they can produce efficient and productive results. And it is this innate nature that is built in us really helps us handle big variables that impact the world. And we most certainly have big problems impacting the world. And as we all know, the global pandemic has impacted well over well over 16 million people, and it has really impacted, uh, pretty much shut down the world. Now, even before leading into this pandemic, we have a scenario where about 71 million people were impacted due to refugees and uh, uh, in the form of displaced people. And for the last five years or so, Global leaders have been talking about close to um, multiple sections of the society not having enough access to healthcare. And it is by some estimates, we have about 3.5 billion people who, are, who lack access to essential healthcare services. And in spite of having all these problems, what excites me the most is our ability to really thrive and fight valiantly against all these various scenarios and situations that is thrown into us. Now, let us look at some of the massive improvements that we have made in the world. In the last, just in the last 30 years, we have made a huge impact on infant mortality rate. It was 6.5% in 1990, it is 2.9% now. On life expectancy, we have increased it in the last 75 years from 46 years to 73 years. Now, sometimes when you see a graph like this, you really cannot relate to the magnitude of the change that is being made. Now, let me look at this from a different lens. Um, you know, uh, what this actually means is, uh, I am 48 years old, uh, and that means that if I was born in 1950, this simply means that the odds of me not being alive to make this presentation becomes very, very high, right? It is that kind of an impact that um, our human race have made, and uh, we should be super proud of how we have reacted to various situations and various scenarios that is thrown into us. Now, a drop, we actually went back and looked at what is the fundamental reason why humans have this ability to constantly rise up to the occasion? And we, our researchers presented multiple hypotheses, and one hypothesis that came close to my heart was the fact that over time, the literacy and the adoption, the education embracement that we have done as a society has just been phenomenal. Just look at this graph. We have, in early 800, 1800, the illiteracy rate is estimated to be around 88%. And now in 2016, that illiteracy rate is 13.75%. So what does this mean? In, in little over two centuries, we have literally changed the world upside down and in a positive way. And it is this learning and the passion to continuously learn and 
really figure out the challenges is making this world a fantastic place to live and an amazing uh, opportunity for enterprises to thrive. Now, one of the interesting things that we all heard in uh, multiple keynotes um, and sessions is companies are adopting to digital in a very, at a very higher pace. In fact, um, even leading into this COVID crisis, digital transformation has been a very key business initiative that many people adopted. And the COVID crisis has only accelerated that. Um, we saw evidence of that in multiple panels, multiple keynotes throughout this fascinating conference, right? We um, believe that the limits of anti-fragility for enterprises is going to come primarily from the fact that while adopting such digital intentions, we will be responsible to provide the necessary skills to execute that through. And as a consequence of that, uh, we built a very simple model, what we called as the digital acceleration simulation model. There are really three variables built in this model, right? Uh, one, we organized all the job families into a simple taxonomy. This included the job families of AI, big data, IoT, the usual suspects, right? And then we looked at how many people are employed through these technologies across the globe. So we call that as a supply model or um, supply, um, supply line, right? The second component, we then looked at uh, university supply and used a very small part of the relevant university supply. And one clarification I would like to make is, how do you really uh, map? Uh, we, we mapped a portion of the university supply to come into our supply line. And the third line is really the demand line, which is the number of jobs that are open, right? And we adjusted that to remove some of the scale job descriptions in the space. Now, the model gave us uh, a fascinating look. Now, when we look at the current scenario, the gap between supply and demand is around 3 million people. That means the demand is over supply by about 3 million jobs. Now, this is expected to grow into 7 million in the next seven years, right? And some of the scenarios that we ran in simulation even yielded to a bigger gap. What is fascinating is I'm using the term gap from a modeling perspective, right? But you could actually flip that and say that is really the opportunity in front of our leaders, right? That means if we get the reskilling aspects and the learning aspects or the learning of the precision technical learning and other relevant components very, very right, then we have a great opportunity as leaders in this space to bring in another 7 million lives into the digital transformation bandwagon, right? And that to me is the first, the, the big great hunger quenching point that we talked about in some of the keynotes yesterday. And that is very, very satisfying and inspiring for me to really continue this journey in the areas of, um, you know, in the talent space. Now, what happens in, uh, um, you know, Pari in his keynote yesterday mentioned that um, really the l and aspect of, um, uh, of various enterprises is intact and have done, in, in fact, uh, his comment was we have done phenomenal job in that. While that is true, um, you know, largely, um, some of the very interesting components that are happening with respect to the pandemic is has some some sort of uh, has introduced a complexity in l and d what i mean by that is let us uh, understand this by looking at the footprint of an european automotive giant right now this particular company does business with uh, like have r and d centers across multiple locations multiple regions um, they have about 20 locations and they do R&D work across Asia, Europe, and uh, North American locations. Now, when uh, 
the COVID hit, uh, we actually mapped some of the Twitter feeds of the engineers reporting from where they are working from. And that showed that from Bangalore, the engineering talent actually spread out to multiple cities, to 20 to 25 tier two and tier three cities. Now, why is this a problem from, a, uh, from an enterprise um, standpoint, uh, problem or an opportunity, right? Uh, one of the foundational things uh, which we may not have really acknowledged from um, a standpoint of uh, recognizing this, but um, one of the important things is like the engineers and uh, our resources in general, we learn a lot from our peers. We learn a lot from our peers, we learn a lot from our managers and the inspiring leaders who lead us. And this type of distribution suddenly introduces a variable that many enterprises uh, cannot necessarily handle, right? Um, and uh, some of you here may be familiar with, uh, um, you know, the, the psychologist Albert Bandura, who said that the foundational nature of why we solve problem is about 16 to 65%, is an astronomical number, right? Uh, why we solve a problem is really because we believe that we can solve the problem. And that is the foundation of solving any problem. And that is actually called as the very popular self-efficacy theory. So this self-efficacy is built by relentless number of uh, uh, interactions between colleagues, managers, and leaders. Now, I highlight that because as that is disrupted, we need to bring that magic back to our online and collaborative learning mechanism. And not doing that can prove very expensive over a long period of time. Now, uh, at this stage, we went back and looked at what are the new trends, new techniques that we can bring in and really provide you some insights around um, you know, uh, how we can refine our existing learning models, right? And uh, we really had a lot of fun understanding the different um, research work in this space, dissertations in this space. One of the fascinating paper that we really highlighted, uh, that enjoyed uh, looking at it was an experiment, was a micro experiment, in fact, that was done by um, Schaffer and Cope, really in, an, uh, in uh, a, a Fortune 500 company. What they did was they put a very simple experience coach in a learning uh, in the learning environment, right? And this experience coach would follow an empathy-based model, empathy-based feedback, constantly logged in the learning um, environment. That means uh, you know it could be statements like uh, we really understand uh, the challenge that you are uh, in you are trying to learn a new skill while also have uh, another job. And uh, all these type of empathetic statements slowly over a period of six weeks draw up participation. And what is uh, even more exciting for me is the engagement in terms of the length of the comments slowly increased. And uh, at the end of the six weeks, they noticed that the, the uptake of that course was significantly higher and very different than any other model that they have seen. Now, this is a very, very simple incremental change that we can make to our online, um, um, in, you know, or our digital learning ecosystem that can give very good ROI. And the beauty of this is you can measure it from a micro uh, experiment standpoint and truly uh, implement and scale. Now, one of my long-term um, passion is we have to take extra care in making sure underrepresented minorities are not left out. And um, anyone who is a little bit familiar with uh, network analysis um, would really um, have a very busy job right now because uh, we can look at where clusters of decision-making is evolving, right? And uh, often uh, this may lead to a scenario that underrepresented minorities may be left out of this digital learning ecosystem. And that may, the term underrepresented may mean different things in different regions. I know uh, uh, we have multiple regions 
in this uh, participating in this conference. But a study that was done by South African banks was unbelievably fascinating. The, the South African banks really looked at a scenario where why, in spite of hiring very diverse candidates, they do not have enough representation at the top, at the seniority level. When they decoded that, it really pointed out to say that not being able to imagine what that senior role is had created a bottleneck with the candidates. Now, simplistically put, this means having very effective role models across helping um, underrepresented folks. And uh, this could mean that you may have to look at your external ecosystem, even outside your enterprise, to make that happen. And this study was fascinating. Once again, a small incremental change that can give you phenomenal ROI um, from, a, um, from a learning system standpoint. Now, many of you know that none of this would matter unless we truly believe that reskilling is not just an HR initiative and it is an enterprise initiative. We truly need to bring in all the leaders together, SMEs together, and really develop a blueprint from a standpoint of documenting critical skills and understanding peers' digital intentions, and also start thinking about the disrupted roles in the enterprise. So through that model, we have to develop analysis around how do we bring more people into backend engineering? How do we make our testing folks get into software development? How do we think about call center folks being transitioned into inside sales representative? What side sort of plan can we put for our military veterans to get into digital marketing, right? So all these scenarios have to be evaluated. And um, one of the concepts that um, I'm really a big fan of is micro experiments. That means you do not have to envision everything as a very big project. And you can think in terms of incremental activities. So for example, you could say that I'm going to work on making these three testing folks into a software engineer and pilot that and learn from that experience and then scale. And none of this is really going to be easy. Um, we truly have to be passionate. We have to bring our minds and hearts together and start thinking about how can we make an impact on reskilling and upskilling. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. And that's a very powerful statement and very relevant here because we have to come together together as one big team and think enterprise reskilling as a very key priority for our digital transformation. And when we do that, it is not just we get the skills that are required to satisfy our digital demand but also we would have taken a very key step towards making the entire world an anti-fragile world. And that to me is a fantastic and noble initiative that I'm sure all of us can be inspired and excited to sign up for. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present.